If you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope you do, I want to encourage you to open them to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. If you have been with us this week throughout this Passion Week, we have been looking at the final week of Christ's life. And throughout the gospel narratives, as they walk us through the final days of Christ, we have seen a world of peoples conspiring together against Christ. You see Jews and Gentiles. You see Rome and Israel. You see Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. You see the religious and even criminals all gathered together against Christ. Almost every segment of society is represented in one way, shape, or another. And each of them have their differences. In fact, quite often these groups could never get along. But in one area, they are unified. They do not want Christ as their king. And so they reject him and they kill him. And it begs the question, a question that we all have to ask ourselves at some point or another. And the question is this, who is Jesus? Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. It's a a royal psalm. It, It contains this coronation formula that was used when a new king was installed The father would go out with the son and he would say to the nation, today's the day. Today's the day in which now my son will begin his reign. And even though the the people probably knew that day was coming, this was the day that made it official. And so something uh, very similar to this was probably read at the uh, installation of every Jewish king. But if you read this psalm carefully, as we will do this morning, you will note that no earthly king could justify the language that is used here. That what is said here is too great for any earthly king. So then the question becomes, who is the psalmist referring to? Well, the New Testament quotes Psalm 2 eight times that oftentimes we're not very familiar with this psalm but the new testament writers were very familiar with psalm 2 and in every instance they they attach this psalm to one person to jesus christ psalm 2 finds its fulfillment in jesus christ alone That he is the king of all kings, and he is the Lord of all lords. So look at it with me together this morning. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, for he said to me, You're my son. Today I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, so that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. We're going to pray together before we walk through this text. And uh, as we've done in many weeks now, if you have the ability to just take a knee, 
Um, if you can't, that's okay. But I'm going to take a knee right here this morning. And if you have the ability to do so, I would encourage you to do so. Just as we plead with God, would he, would he move this morning in our hearts and our lives? So would you, would you join me this morning in prayer? Lord, as we come before you today on this Easter Sunday. God, we want to acknowledge you as the king of all kings. The Lord of all lords. God, we take a knee before you this morning. Because we are humbled in your presence and in the presence of your word. And we are pleading with you this morning to speak into our lives. Not one person listening this morning needs to hear a word from me. But all of us today. All of us need to hear your voice. God, I pray that you would glorify your son, Jesus. I pray that every person listening or watching this morning would see the glory of Jesus Christ, the king, the one who has conquered the grave and the only one in which we can find refuge and salvation. God, protect us from any distraction. Help us to hear your voice and your word today. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we come to uh, this psalm, there is one point that the psalmist is really making. And that's that Christ is the king. That he is the king of all kings. But how do we see the world respond to the rule and the authority and the reign of Christ? The world rebels. That what we see here is that the world is hostile towards God and Christ. In fact, it says they they take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. That word anointed is the Hebrew word Mashiach. And it means Messiah. In other words, the world is not just opposed to God. They are opposed to Jesus Christ. It's interesting to me that most people don't get too upset when you just talk about God. But whenever you start talking about Jesus, people will begin to get a little anxious or a little uneasy. Why? Because in Christ, God loses his grayness. You start talking about Jesus, then all of a sudden you start narrowing the focus. When you start talking about Christ, you begin to get exclusive. So the picture here is we don't want God and we don't want Jesus. And the psalmist makes clear it's not that they just don't want God and they don't want Jesus. They don't want his fetters. Many of the translators will tell you that that fetters might better be translated yoke, meaning that they're not just upset because they're in prison, but because they have these chains and these fetters. They are angry because they have an owner, that there is someone who owns them. There is someone who controls their life, that there is a creator God who has rights over them. And the heartbeat of the world is, I want to be my own. That's the mantra of the world. I want to be my own. I belong to no one but myself. I answer to nobody but me. I am the master of my own fate. And if you don't believe this, then you've never had children and you've never been a teenager. How many of you growing up, your parents gave you a curfew Gave you a restriction and you said, Mother, Father, you are a great blessing to me. Your love is overwhelming. I shall be home early this evening so that we can read the holy book together. No. What was your response? You rebelled. Listen, we are born sinners. We have a natural inclination in us due to our sin to rebel against the ownership of God and the ownership of Christ. In fact, Paul in Ephesians and Colossians, Colossians 1, Ephesians 2, he will tell us all that prior to faith in Christ, 
We were at enmity with God. We were enemies of God, not just neutral. We were hostile. And that's really what we're seeing here. We're seeing here. This is not, if you read the psalm, he's not talking just about indifference. He's talking about hostility. This isn't apathy. This is hatred that the world rages against God and against the control of Christ. And you might say, well, Pastor, that, that, you're a little over the top on this deal. Maybe you're, uh, you're being a little overly dramatic. Uh, people aren't hostile towards God. They're just, they're just indifferent. And uh, I'll tell you that I, I think, to a large extent, the world is not hostile towards the idea of God. But listen to me. I believe that the majority of this world is very hostile to the God of the Bible and the exclusivity of his son Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation. You see, the Bible says very plainly that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Meaning Jesus is the only means of salvation and if you don't trust him the bible tells us very plainly that you will spend eternity in a place of eternal torment that is called hell most people don't mind talking about god as long as you say well you can get to him any way you wanted to get to him you start talking about the exclusivity of christ as he's presented in the bible people start getting angry Even more than this, it was Jesus who said, you can't even be my disciple unless you hate your mother and father. Meaning if you want to be my disciple, your love for me has to be so great that your feelings towards anyone else would seem like hatred. Listen, people don't mind the idea of God, but they don't want the moral the societal, the marital, and the sexual absolutes and truth that he puts forth in his word. They are hostile towards that. And in fact, some of you are getting angry right now just hearing about it. So here you have the picture of man. Just picture the world. It's a picture of our world today. Man shaking his his fist at God. I don't want you. I don't want your son, Jesus, and I don't want your word. I don't want you telling me what to do. Now, what will the response of God be? Will it say that God trembled at their rebellion? Will it say that God took counsel against the wisdom and the might of these great creatures? No, look at verses four through six. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he'll speak to them in his anger and he'll terrify them in his fury saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. The response of God is that God laughs. The rebellion of the world towards God, Christ, and his word is laughable. It would be like me stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson during his prime. He would laugh at me. He wouldn't laugh at the pain he would inflict on me because there wouldn't be that much pain. He'd hit me, I'd hit the ground, that'd be it. He would laugh at the audacity and the arrogance of some scrawny guy like me even thinking that I could step into the ring with somebody like him. And that's what it means when it says that God laughs, that I made those people. I spoke everything into existence. I'm the God of all creation. And these guys think they're going to step in the ring with me? Listen, when the Jewish leadership and Pilate and Herod put their brains together and came up with this night, nice neat little plan and they worked it all together and they put Christ on the cross and they thought they were finished with Jesus. Listen to me. God laughed. You haven't seen anything yet. So go ahead, make your plans. 
falsely accuse him, falsely try him, mock him, beat him, scourge him, put him on a cross, and put him in the tomb. But you will not have the last word because all of your rage and your rebellion against me and Christ is futile. That man crucified him, God exalted him, and said, he is my king. And so, so it is today. There's a lot of people out there. They mock God. They mock his judgment. They mock Christ. They take his name in vain. They mock his grace. They mock his salvation and his resurrection. You know the question that I've often asked, why doesn't God just wipe them off the face of the planet? I was listening to the news a few weeks back and some man was mocking our vice president for praying before a meeting. And I confess to you, I got mad and if I had been God, I would have caused a lightning bolt to come down and incinerate the man right there. Why didn't God do that? Because listen to me today. God is patient. There's only one thing that prevents God from right now coming down in judgment and wiping all of them out. And it's not the wisdom and the might of those who rebel. It's the graciousness and the patience of the God that we love. That he is patient and he desires none to perish, but all to come to faith and repentance in his son Jesus. But listen, God says here, he will speak to them in his anger and he will terrify them in his fury. And what is his message? His message is, I have installed my king. In other words, it doesn't really matter what you think or even you, what you want or even what you do. Jesus is king. God says, I have decided who is king and it isn't you This is not a democracy. Jesus is king. You're not voting him in. He's not running for savior. God decides. And God says Christ is king. And he's the only refuge. He's the only means of salvation. Well, look at verses 7 through 9. I will surely tell the decree of my Lord. For he said to me, you're my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I'll surely give you the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. So here is Christ. Jesus now speaks. This is the only time in the Old Testament where Jesus speaks. And what does he say? He tells of the decree that the Father has made about him. Again, here we see this this coronation formula. We have a coronation uh, formula for the president that he puts his hand on on a Bible and he swears to uphold the Constitution. Well, in these days, the king, he would place the crown on his son, on the prince, and he would say, you're my son. He would acknowledge this is not an overthrow. This is not a coup. You are the rightful heir. And then he would say, today I have begotten you. There's only one event in the life of Christ that is attached to that phrase, today I've begotten you. Any guesses what event in Christ's life it was, this being Easter weekend? Well, it wasn't his birth. The incarnation, powerful. But not today I've begotten you. Not at his baptism. You remember at his baptism, the heavens open, God speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But he doesn't say today I've begotten you. At the transfiguration, you remember Jesus takes the inner three up on that mountain before he goes to the cross and he kind of wants, wants them to see his glory. 
Peter would later say he made the prophetic word more certain. And he showed them his glory. And God speaks from heaven and he says, this is my son, listen to him. But he doesn't say, today I've begotten you. Only one event in Christ's life is attached to this phrase. And we find it in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 through verse 33. The apostle Paul says, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled the promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Only at the resurrection do we hear that phrase, today I've begotten you. So, so even though Jesus is eternally God, Jesus is eternally the son of God, And even though it was foreordained that he would be the king, that he would be the heir to the kingdom, it is most fully realized at his resurrection. That at the resurrection you have an individual who has physically lived a perfect and sinless life. He physically died a horrific death on the cross. He was physically placed in a tomb. And on the third day, he physically rose and he ascended to the Father never to die again. And God, in an acknowledgement of the victory that Christ has accomplished in his death and resurrection over sin, Satan, and death, looks at the Son and says, today I have begotten you that you are the rightful heir, and today you begin your reign. Paul said in Romans that Christ is declared with power to be the Son of God through the resurrection from the dead. Listen, when a person lives, dies on a cross and is placed in a tomb and then is raised on the third day, never to die again, that's a pretty good tip off that they're God. And God says he's not only God, he's king. He's the rightful heir. And then God says to him what? Ask of me. And I'll give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. God says to Jesus, Jesus, you you just say the word and the rebel band that has mocked you and rebelled against you, you just say the word and they're yours. This King Jesus, he has an inheritance, and it's the nations. One day they'll be his. The next event of salvation history is the return of Christ. And the nations are his. And what is God waiting on? He's waiting on the word of Christ. Listen to me today. The world is one word away from its demise. That God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world through a man. And the trumpet will resound and the Lord will descend and the clouds will be rolled back as a scroll and Christ will come and the nations will be his and he shall break them with a rod of iron and he shall shatter them like earthenware. In fact, in Revelation 19, we've got a great picture of this. I want to read it to you just so you can hear it this morning. In Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, it's called the battle of Armageddon. And quite honestly, it's not much of a battle. It's quick, it's decisive, and you don't want to be on the wrong side. And Christ returns, and listen to what it says. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. You remember when Christ entered into Jerusalem? He rode in on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, now he's traded in the colt, the foal of a donkey, for a Sherman tank. And he comes not to die for the sins of man. He comes to judge the nations. 
And it says, his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one else knows except himself. And he's clothed with a robe uh, dipped in blood. And it's not his blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following with him on white horses. That's those of us who have trusted in Christ. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And what does it say? It quotes from Psalm 2. And it says, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Listen, this is not your grandma's Jesus right here. This is the king of all kings. Do you see what is being said here? God has declared, whether you want him to be or not, God has declared he's king. He has been declared king He has been demonstrated to be the king through his resurrection. And God has given to him the nations. And one day he's coming back to rule and to reign. And in light of this knowledge of who Christ is and what he's one day coming to do, the psalmist ends in a very practical way. The psalmist gives you a very stern warning. Look with me back in Psalm 2, verses 10 through 12. It says, Therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. In light of the knowledge of who Christ is, who he's been declared to be, what he's done, and what he's going to do, The psalmist warns you and says, show discernment. In other words, wise up. If you're out there today and you've been rebelling against Christ, you've been shrugging him off, living however you want to live, doing whatever you want to do, the psalmist says, you better wise up and you better think about what you're doing because you cannot overthrow the authority of Christ. Your efforts are futile. Worship Jesus. Do homage to Christ. That word homage, some of your translations will will say kiss the son. It means that instead of fighting against Christ, embrace him. Instead of rebelling against him, surrender to him. Instead of bowing your neck to his sovereignty and his authority, bend the knee. Why? Because his wrath may soon be kindled. And you will perish in the way, meaning you can either bend the knee today willingly and know his salvation and his forgiveness and his grace and his life, or you can bend the knee forcibly one day when he returns in his glory and you will know his wrath And you will know his judgment. But listen to me. One day you're going to bow. Psalm 2 says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. Listen, I know this is Easter weekend. And it would be so easy with all the sentimentalism surrounding Easter and certainly in light of all the events we're facing, it would be so tempting to just give you some feel-good stuff. And some of you, you invited your neighbors, your, your friends, maybe a family member to watch with you and you say, hey, come over, listen to Pastor Chad. He, he's not one of those hell and damnation preachers. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you this morning. But I am committed to telling you the truth. The Bible is set within the context of hell and damnation. The Bible gives us some very stern warnings because God loves us. You can't shrug off 
Christ. You can't dismiss him. You can't ignore him. At some point, you have got to deal with him. And my prayer today is that you would see his sovereignty and his glory and you would embrace him as your Lord and Savior so that one day you would know him as your judge and experience his wrath. So the psalmist, he ends not with a warning, he ends with a promise. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. He's telling you today, there's there's no refuge from him. You can't run from him. You can't hide from Jesus. But you can run to him. And if you run to him, you will know his grace. You will know his salvation. You will know his freedom. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've ever done, He will receive you today if you'll return to him in in repentance and faith and he'll wrap his arms around you and you know what you'll find? You'll find true freedom. It's so interesting to me this this world wants to break free of, of God and Christ and his word. If we could just get rid of all these archaic ideas of God and the Bible and Jesus, then we'd be free. And to a large extent, our culture today, it has thrown off Christ. It has thrown off the Bible. But here's the question. Are they really free? I think if you look closely today, they might be freed from the fetters of Christ. But they are in bondage to loneliness and depression and all kinds of evil substances and pornography and evil activities that leave them empty. Can I tell you today, there's only one place to find true freedom. And it's found in Christ in submission to his will. Now a picture of this in the New Testament is the story that we're probably all familiar with, the prodigal son. That son says to his father, I don't want your rules, I don't want your house, and I don't want you. In fact, I wish you were dead. Just give me my inheritance now. And the father gives the inheritance to him, and the son leaves. And in his mind, he's probably thinking, I'm finally free. I can do whatever I want, go wherever I want. And he has fun for a little while. But eventually he finds himself in the mud with the pigs. And all of a sudden, the father and his house don't don't sound so bad. And all those restrictions that that seemed and appeared to be so restrictive long ago, now feel like acts of love and grace. And he longs to be under the Father's house. He got nowhere else to go. He heads home, but he knows he can't hide from the Father. The Father knows everything. So he's re- kind of come up with a little speech I'll tell him, Father, I, I, I've goofed up, man. I, I've messed up. I've blown it. But, but I'm not asking to come back with all the privileges of one of your sons. I just want to be a servant. He probably recited that thing a thousand times over on the way home. But you remember how the story ends? The son's a long distance off, and what is happening? The father's been watching. He's been waiting. And as he sees that son on the horizon before the son can even begin to run to him, the father runs to him. That son probably stinks. The father doesn't care. He embraces that son. And the son embraces him back. You see, to me, that's the ultimate issue Have you been caught up in the embrace of Christ? 
Have you run to him as your refuge? Have you surrendered to him as king? There's no refuge from him. One day you will face him. The king of all kings. What are you going to do? You're going to walk up to him chewing gum and tell him about your uncle who's a pastor, or your mama who used to play piano at the church, or about all your, your good deeds, thinking you're going to somehow impress God? Or will you fall and tremble in his presence, realizing you are a sinner? And he's your only hope of salvation. There's no refuge from him, but there is refuge in him. So listen, you've got one of two options this morning. You can rage with the fools, or you can surrender to the king. You know, with this virus and all the stuff that's come along, it appears to me that just about everybody has come to the agreement and the conclusion that we need saving. All the brilliant minds, greatest scientists, best doctors, all the political pundits, they would agree we need saving. Now, they might not agree on what can save us or who can save us, but I think they would agree today that money can't save us. Politics can't save us. Politicians can't save us. Listen, I'm here to tell you today, there is only one true Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. But you know what's so awesome about Jesus? Not only is he the only true Savior, he's the best Savior. You know, if you're going to have a Savior, you might as well have the best one. You trust in Jesus as your Savior. Listen, he's all-knowing. He's all-wise. Listen, when I'm looking for a Savior, I don't want to go to somebody and tell him about my problems and him say, well, listen, I've got go, to go read a book about that, and I'll, I'll get back with you. No, I want a Savior who I take to my problems, and he is the book. You trust in Christ, you got a Savior who's all-knowing. He'll come to you in the darkest moments of your life, and he will instruct you, he will lead you, he will guide you, and he will become to you a refuge. He's everlasting. He knows the end at the beginning. He defeated the grave. He lives. Meaning that, that, that when I come to that moment, we're all going to come to. That moment of death. When I come to that moment, I know I've got a Savior who's been there and he's walked through that valley and he came out victorious. And in that moment, he will take me by the hand and he will lead me home. And he is my refuge and he's the best refuge. He's the best Savior. I got a nice house. It's not the best house in Kansas City. I'm not the pastor of the largest church. I might not drive the best truck. I might not wear the most expensive clothes. But listen, I have the best Savior. He is my refuge. And I can't imagine life without him. He has saved me. He has changed me. And he can save you too. How blessed are those who run to him, who take refuge in him. Listen, if you know you're a sinner this morning, and maybe you're seeing Christ for the first time as your only hope of salvation, I am pleading with you, run to him. You can't run from him but you can run to him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you have loved us. God, we are sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of your glory. 
And the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is death and hell. And if you left us in that place, it would be us getting what we justly deserve. You couldn't simply overlook our sin. And so you sent your son. And he lived the life we couldn't. He died the death we should have. He bore our sins on the cross. And he died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Christ died in our place and he overcame the grave in his resurrection verifying that he is who he said he was. And now he is the way of salvation. He's not a way. God, we know that he is the only way. God, I pray that if there's anybody here today They have rebelled against you. They have been hostile towards you, your word, and your son. God, I pray that they would see that you have gotten down on their level. You have bore their sins. And you are saying to them this morning, come to me. There's grace. There's forgiveness. There's freedom. But God, I pray today they would be warned that if they will not bend the knee, if they will not trust in you, there's a day coming. God, work in their hearts to draw them to yourself. And I pray this all in the precious name of our Savior and the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Amen.